Uh, any question from the audience? to ask uh, Mohammed, he's our neuroideologist here, whether we do give contrast for uh, routinely for MRVs for serotumor cerebri syndrome. Uh, our usual protocol is uh, to do non-contrast MRV, uh, and if we still see some narrowing in uh, one of the transverse sinuses, uh, we have two choices, uh, either to give uh, contrast MRV, uh, we use ethical protocol. Uh, sometimes uh, we, we can also use uh, CTV, which is a CT venogram. Uh, just uh, we have timing the bolus of the injection and we image uh, uh, the brain CT during the venous phase. So my second question is, there's a talk in the neuro-ophthalmology uh, community. Do you image any cranial neuropathy even in a patient with uh, vasculopathic risk factors who for the world looks like a diabetic because um, there are people there who believe that you should basically image everybody. Um, I wanted to comment about the radiologist comment which I agree with. I think it's reasonable to do a non-contrast homophyte MR venogram if it's normal then you don't need to give the contrast. We do use the uh, auto tr um, triggered elliptocentric oriented uh, etico uh, bolus, time bolus for our contrast MR venograms. Uh, but a, a time of flight is sometimes necessary because the patient can't have contrast because they got bad GFR, 10 million other reasons. So it's not that it can't be used. It's only used to get rid of the artifacts. The second question is on isolated ocular motor cranial neuropathy. So I'll just tell you my bias and then maybe the others can comment. Uh, I have not been imaging isolated, neurologically isolated ischemic cranial neuropathy if it's completely typical if the person is a vascular path. I, I, I wait and, and image them only if it doesn't get better or if it progresses. Uh, but the papers that have been shown, that there, there is some yield to doing this because some of those patients actually do have meningioma and diabetes, right? Uh, but none of the cases that have been shown to me have, that were imaged that it didn't make that much difference uh, waiting three to four weeks. Uh, and perhaps Peter can comment about this because he probably has a contrarian view. The, uh, the articles that are out there that say you should Im image are uh, uh, largely terrible. Uh, and one of the worst came from a radiology department uh, where they said that 69% of the people with isolated mononeuropathies had pathology, but they didn't talk about age, they didn't talk about history or anything else. And one of the better articles said that it was as high as 13 or 15 percent had mass lesions. Uh, so in order to sort of answer this question for myself, because I didn't believe that, I, uh, I did a uh, hundred patients in a row at Wills Eye Hospital uh, who came in to see us. Uh, so uh, in their ophthalmology, we would see all the patients with third, fourth, or sixth nerve palsies. And we did MRI with gadolinium on everybody who had a third, fourth, or sixth nerve palsy, independent of age. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the fellow who was working with me hasn't published this yet. Uh, what I will tell you is that there were three patients that had uh, mass lesions. One of them was a patient who had a sixth nerve palsy but had a known history of prostate cancer. So this was known cancer, someone that I would have imaged in anyway. The second was a 45-year-old patient with known MS uh, that had new lesions uh, to explain his sixth nerve palsy. And the third was a patient that would have been missed that had uh, a brainstem AVM that bled, uh, but afterwards uh, it showed that the bleed had destroyed the entire AVM and there was nothing done for him anyway. Uh, and so we found that the incidents, if you, if you use your clinical judgment, and I think what you've heard through here today is if you have good clinical judgment and you know what you're doing, you can use technology specifically more like a scalpel than a sledgehammer. I mean, but there are good people, as you suggest, that say you should image everybody. Jonathan Trobe, who's somebody I respect very much, 
uh, in the latest or the one before issue of the Journal of Neuro-Ophthalmology, she came out and said you should image everybody with a third nerve palsy. Everybody, no matter what. Because in this day and age, you don't want to miss an aneurysm. And part of our problem in the United States is the medical legal one. We have over a million lawyers in the United States. Uh, so uh, uh, we do a lot of things for defensive medicine. But the statistics, as far as I'm concerned, if you have good, in the appropriate age range, a modern neuropathy, you, I don't think there's much danger at all of waiting and imaging the patient only if they don't get better in this prescribed period of time. I, I think, you know, for the different palsies, certainly for fourth nerve palsies, there's not much evidence. I mean, the incidence of serious pathology there is so low that it's not really worth it in the garden variety case. I think with the sixth nerve palsies, you know, there's a bit more stuff that lurks out there. But I agree, you know, the whole idea of the clinical thing, it partly depends upon how comfortable you are with your own neurologic examination. If you're an ophthalmologist, you know, you've got to be able to take a proper history and be able to know well, what are the other kinds of neighborhood signs. You know, for me in the clinic, I teach residents, I say, you know what, figuring out that this is a third nerve palsy, a fourth nerve palsy, a sixth nerve palsy, that's great. But that's basic. What you need to know is, so you've got this person with this lesion, what you should you be looking for next? You know, we're along, think about the course of the sixth nerve palsy. Think about the other neurological signs you've got to be looking for. If you don't know how to look for them, you're not going to be able to screen for the dangerous ones. And just to give you an example, you know, one patient I had, and I think it's a good illustration of this. You know, uh, he was about six, 60 year old guy, 20 year history of hypertension, comes in with four days of double vision, a complete uh, left sixth nerve palsy. So, Nothing. He doesn't have anything else to add. On my neurologic exam, I go there, I tap his chin with, you know, a cold object. He can't feel it. How long has that been there? Oh, about a month. I can't notice that I couldn't feel anything in my chin. Well, we know in neurology, a mental neuropathy is cancer and and otherwise. This guy had a basal skull net that causes six nerve. I would have diagnosed him hypertensive, a six, you know, a microvascular six, if I hadn't done a neurologic examination. And I knew I had to do that because I know that you got to look for trigeminal stuff. you got to look for, you know, the pyramidal signs. you got to be able to look for those things. So if you're not comfortable about that with a sixth palsy, I think you've got to get a neurologist to help you with that. The other way of saying that from an ophthalmologist standpoint is I had a senior partner one time who said that uh, neuro-ophthalmologists need to be able to count to seven, not just three, four, and six. <laughs> <laughs> we might be able to skip one most of the time, but... Yeah. Well, you know, we've all been saying in the, in the age range for vasculopathic, um, and so certainly that means if you have a patient who's in their 50s, then you should really worry about that patient, even if the cranial nerve palsy looks isolated, I believe. Um, and, um, and you should really be worrying about uh, six nerve palsies, as has been stated. I left out of my chiasm talk a patient who presented with a isolated six nerve palsy. Neuroradiology read his initial MRI as normal and told me that what I thought I saw was nothing. It was just some artifact or whatever. Whatever. And then, and, but three months later, I repeated his MRI, and then they were sure that what we saw associated with his six nerve palsy was, in fact, an early chondrosarcoma, and he's now survived uh, four and a half years. So I think that it is, if you choose not to image, you have to follow carefully, and you should pick your patients really carefully, because you want to save that one that comes through, but otherwise you would not. I, I think the following up is a good point. You know, if you think it's microvascular, you should follow them to make sure that they get better and that it behaves like a microvascular. Okay, once it's, if you're going to do that, you, you know, you need to make sure that observation means just exactly that. It doesn't mean sending them out and that's it. You have to kind of make sure that this behaves the way you think it does. As soon as it starts deviating from the expected course, you've got an image. Not only that, you probably have to do it with NLP. Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> well, no, there's, there's stuff. You, you, image, you don't see anything in the image. You know, if it's a progressive problem, you've got you to gotta do it. Yes. Uh, for Dr. Chavis, do you have uh, a lot of uh, referral from pediatric neurology uh, for infants on vigabatrin to take uh, baseline e uh, ERG? Oh, I'm sorry, baseline ERG in infants? Yeah, uh, for taking like a, a gigabatrin. 
Yeah, well, you know, um, the um, uh, electrodes today from ERG are very easy. There are lid electrodes that uh, that sit in, in a tear film right along the lid margin, um, and um, and you can induce uh, ketamine anesthesia in a child and get an ERG in the um, OR if you need. The reality is is that if you're looking at a child with infantile spasms and you're going to use vigabatrin in that age group, you really don't probably need to bother with the ERG because you're what hopefully it will be vigabatrin for one year and then it will be over and the child will be or have gotten through the time of the infantile spasms when they are uh, so associated with poor uh, quality of, of, of life after that. And so you've gotten through that initial part and the, and the EEG should stabilize and they should be all right. If you're looking at an adult with complex partial seizures, the EEG, the ERG is an easier thing and it's, um, uh, and I think it's probably um, uh, worthwhile to do. The answer is not there. That's my my feeling on it. The answer is not in the literature yet. There is a big study going on that's going to be starting in the U.S. looking at all of these factors with vigabatrin. So in, in a year or so, we should have a little more information. Uh, you, sorry, uh, you mentioned an important point because we have uh, a lot of referral for a patient with the functional visual loss and they uh, put a comment that the uh, visual evoke response is abnormal. And you see no comment on relative afferent pupillary defect, which uh, we believe is more important. It is something a patient cannot uh, change, cannot fake relative afferent pupillary defect. Whereas visual evoke response, if he intentionally look away from stimulus, he can produce an abnormal visual evoke response. That's right. And your technician can help you with that and help them maintain fixation. You also can um, um, atronize the pupil put up the patient's full cycloplegic refraction and do your VEP. And then it doesn't matter where they, you know, it really does not matter if they're consciously defocusing because you've eliminated that as a, as a, um, as a factor. And then you can measure the VEP. Last uh, comment. We make them hold a laser pointer on a fixation target during the testing so that they cannot look away. They have to hold the target onto. There, there was this wonderful article in uh, uh, many, many years ago in, in neurology where they went to a VEP lab and they took a bunch of medical students and they said, we're going to do a VEP on you and we want you to try to fool the technician by uh, getting an abnormal VEP, look off to the side, sort of do whatever you want. And then they told the technician, these people coming in are going to try to fool you. So we want to make sure that you keep track of them. And the technicians were able to pick up the people that looked off a little bit. But since this study was done in California, they had a couple of people who meditated during the test. Uh, and they were never found to, to wander from fixation. And, and one of them actually extinguished this VEP. So it, it is not as 100% objective uh, as, as some people uh, make it out to be. It is patient and technician dependent. Just, just uh, last question. Uh, there are some patients who are uh, uh, known to have, for, for example, photosensitive epilepsy. They call it. Uh, they can get uh, uh, seizures uh, if exposed to certain flicker of light. Uh, have you ever uh, faced a, a patient during the ERG testing with the flickering uh, uh, that they get uh, seizures? Um, um, no, I have not. Although they certainly, uh, what you're talking about is um, photo driving, um, uh, producing seizures, and uh, photo driving is something we do during EEG. And if the patient drives photo um, that is associated with with migraine, and there may be some link um, in some patients to seizure disorders, which can be linked as well. Um, I've not had that happen, but you know, um, photic, uh, but flicker when you're doing it um, is um, we don't do it as long as we do photic driving, and um, so I, I think it's been fairly safe. We've not had an issue at all. I mean, I've never seen one reported. If, if it's been reported, I've certainly missed it, but I'm not aware of that. There was a Japanese anime cartoon that was broadcast that caused seizures in a number of children watching the television show at that time. I don't know if Jason remembers remember, that. Yeah, I remember that. I, I knew new TV was bad for you. Do we have time for one more question? I would like to thank all our guest speakers. My question uh, to Dr. Jeeves. Uh, 
uh, could I ask about EOG? Uh, it is uh, known that it is uh, its origin from RBE. It, its origin comes from RBE, uh, the EOG. Uh, but some uh, conditions with RBE changes, uh, like uh, retropathy and other uh, conditions, uh, EOG is normal. And uh, macular vitelliform dystrophy, which is uh, only a macular region, EOG is abnormal. So, uh, I don't know, is it of clinical importance to do EOG or not? You know, every test you do is part of a jigsaw puzzle, and you put it together with the rest of the exam. And if you have a patient with BES, and there's a small macular lesion, you're going to get an abnormal EOG. So you, it, it's a clinical picture that you have to use. And what, you, what my point with telling you about the different testing is what it represents when you look at it. And so, um, so if you're looking at EOG, you're looking at retinal pigment epithelial problems. And if there's a small macular lesion to go with that and a flat EOG or an abnormal EOG, then best would leap to my mind if I saw a small macular lesion. Um, so I mean, so it's, all, it's part of a picture that you you, that you use um, to help you with the diagnosis. Certainly, my test today was to talk about how we as neuro-ophthalmologists use electrophysiology. And so I, as I went through my electrophysiology lecture, I took out all the retinal pathologies that you show up and all the ones where we different, differentiate this retinal, this retinal problem or photoreceptor problem from that retinal pigment epithelial problem. So we're just looking at how we as neuro-ophthalmologists would use it. But your point is well taken, is that you have to look at the whole thing together. But I would bet that as neuro-ophthalmologists, uh, we do so few EOGs uh, compared, I don't remember the last time I ordered an EOG. I mean, we do uh, ERGs and VEPs all the time, uh, but EOG is not a neuro-ophthalmic tool. Um, to do, it, and if you, and if unless you have a situation where your ERG is normal, but you have a, you really want to understand what's going on. Patients complaining of, of a lot of, uh, as the patient I told you about, a young woman with a lot of photopsias, and you want to see whether there really could be anything going on to support that and what it could be. Uh, the times when you use it are really limited in general, and especially in neuro ophthalmology. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, 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 if I may take the prerogative to ask Dr. Lee a question. Uh, uh, he wrote uh, uh, a very nice article uh, about, and he talked about it the other day, about what you should do when you see a patient with optic atrophy and no one has seen the acute event. And he said you have to image them, etc., etc. And I been doing that for a long time. One of the things uh, that I've been recently thinking about uh, is you can get optic atrophy uh, from previous optic neuritis if you're young or from previous ischemic optic neuropathy if you're older, but you can also get it from a previous retinal artery occlusion. And I have been recently, because if someone, isn't there a difference between a patient who comes in with optic atrophy who you show their ERG is typical of an ischemic event, don't they deserve more of a workup and a different workup than the patient who may have a normal ERG and an abnormal VEP? Or, or is that off the mark? We do use ERG for that setting, trying to differentiate CRO-related optic atrophy from ischemic optic neuropathy-related optic atrophy in vasculopathic patients. We increasingly use the OCT for the same purpose because in the long term, saying the retina, not OCT of the nerve, but OCT of the retina, and it will show also show that the, the retina is thinned, uh, which would not occur in a primary optic atrophy. So I don't have enough data to support using it solely, but yes, we have used ERG for the exact circumstance that Peter has alluded to. Carotid, the things that, uh, that Jason talked about for embolic disease, uh, carotid and echo for amaurosis fugax, same workup for CRM. Okay, I'll take the panel back here. Thank you very much.